And now for a special session with the Honorable Billy Tozen and uh, Jeff Kluger as an interviewer. Over to you, Jeff. Um, okay, uh, we are back. Uh, you've probably seen too much of me today. I'll be chatting all too briefly uh, with Billy Tozen, uh, President and CEO of Pharma. Uh, I first met Billy a couple of months ago uh, at Aspen out uh, during, in July, and uh, from his storytelling skills alone, I came to appreciate why the people of Louisiana's third district elected him 13 times? Yeah. 13 times. Um, he was the founder, as most folks know, of the Blue Dog Democrats, and wherever you stand on the left-right spectrum, you have to acknowledge that the Blue Dogs are folks who know what they want and are not afraid to go after it. Uh, as head of pharma, Billy's leading in a time of real ferment, and I want to ask him a bit about uh, where he sees the pharmaceutical industry today and what role it will have in shaping uh, the future of healthcare in America, particularly in this time of great transition. Um, I don't know if you want to make an opening uh, remark at all or if I should just lead right in with a couple of questions. Well, just to say this is a critically important time, of course. The committee just uh, approved the Bacchus bill yesterday by a uh, bipartisan vote, if you consider one Republican <laughs> enough to be a bipartisan <laughs> vote. And uh, so it's on to the floor now, and the, 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 the speaker, uh, the, the leader, rather, will uh, organize an effort to combine the HELP committee bill with the Bacchus bill and produce a, a version for the House, uh, Senate floor, rather, and uh, we're on our way now. I think we're finally beginning to see real chances for this legislation to become um, finalized and on the president's desk. And at, on the same day this happens, the Dow hits 10,000. That's kind of interesting day. <laughs> Welcome to Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question that's on uh, uh, most people's mind um, uh, are, is, of course, drug costs. Um, with aggressive reforms in coverage, uh, clearly there's, there's an effort to, to bring drug costs under control. Um, but the fact is uh, a lot of pharmaceuticals, particularly ones under still under patent, remain out of reach for a lot of Americans. Or if they are in reach, it's only uh, because they've made critical trade-offs um, with uh, other things that they could be spending money on. Um, can we do something? Uh, effective and with real short-term effect um, to bring down br drug costs uh, and yet not stifle innovation and stifle the imagination that, that leads to newer drugs. Jeff, yeah, first, first of all, let's put a couple of statistics on the table. Uh, but for, uh, it's important to put all that in perspective if you think about cost. Uh, first of all, drug expenditures in the healthcare dollar are approximately 10%. Uh, gen uh, generic drugs now occupy 72% of the market, the highest generic drug use rate in the world, uh, scheduled to go up to about 85% of the market in the next 10 years. 85% uh, of the market in generic drugs means that patent products, the new discoveries, have to carry the whole weight of the discovery cycle. They have to literally pay for all the investment in research and discovery that goes behind the new medicines that are currently in clinical trials and, and, and future clinical trials. There are about 2,600 of those drugs, by the way, in clinical trials today. There are lots of research going on. Our company spent about uh, roughly about $50 billion last year, record number of dollars, uh, in research for new medicines. But keep that in mind. Right today, about 28% of the drugs in the marketplace have to carry the burden of all that research. And most of the research occurs here in America. That's why we have more discoveries here in America than anywhere in the world. We do 70% of all the world's research in pharmaceuticals. About 80% of all the bio, biologics research in the world is done in America. So Americans carry the biggest burden of all that research. And that's reflected, obviously, in the price of the newer drugs. Uh, but when you average out the price of the newer drugs and the generic prices, uh, you actually come up with some interesting numbers. The interesting numbers are that uh, the inflation rate in drug prices is actually significant, significantly below the inflation rate of health care. It was down about uh, health care inflation was about 6.3 percent. Uh, drug inflation was about 1.5 percent last year. 
likely to remain pretty flat like that. In fact, I saw two of the company reports today, their sales were down a, a point and a half for this year compared to last year. They're in the same recession everybody else is in. Mm-hmm. Also keep in mind about half of the prescriptions that are written for American patients go unfilled today. So your question is a good one. It's a very important one. How do we make sure that patients can access not only the older medicines that are in competition with generic products now at much better prices, but the newer medicines that carry that enormous cost burden of of research behind them? When I got into that, it puzzled me as to why half of the Americans, half of the prescriptions written, rather, wouldn't be filled when we have a program to make free medicine available to people that can't afford it. Uh, we, we started a program five years ago called the, the, the PPA program, which literally uh, provides free drugs to people living under about two, 200% of poverty, uh, some drugs all the way up to 300% of poverty, uh, only upon application. All you have to do is call a hotline number we've set up. Uh, we've got six, what, 450 operators, I think, uh, working, you know, seven, 24, and, they're, um, and they speak 150 different languages. You know, so nobody doesn't have access to free medicines if you live under 200% of poverty and you, and you can't access them because all our companies have these programs and they're available to people. Plus, we hook them up to, we estimate some two, 300 other programs around the country that provide help to people that can't afford their medicines, either government programs or private trust foundations, what have you. It's a triage center for the poor. So don't know I me. Mean, what, what's wrong here? Why do people still have trouble filling their prescriptions and getting their medicines? And, and the answer came back with some kind of startling numbers again. Uh, if you're insured today, if you're lucky to be insured, I suppose most of you in this room are, you'll learn that your insurance covers about 97% of your doctor in your hospitals. You'll also learn that it only covers about 67% of the cost of your medicines. That's the average. The co-pays for medicines are extremely high, even with good insurance. So start with that factor. If you live above 200% of poverty and you, and you have insurance, you're still going to have to pay a significant higher copay for medicines than you will for any other medical service. As a result, many people can't make the co-pays, and so they do without their medicines. And they do without it in increasing numbers during recessionary times. So it's, it's a real problem, John. Secondly, you got a whole body of people that are uninsured, have no insurance at all, and for them, they got to go into the marketplace to pay 100% of the price if, if they need a patent drug as opposed to a generic uh, competitor. So the, uh, yeah, it's a real problem. We faced that problem with seniors some time ago. Remember, seniors were getting on buses and driving into Canada trying to find cheaper drugs because they were having trouble uh, paying for drugs in America. They were having trouble paying for drugs in America because Medicare didn't cover drugs. There was no insurance for it. And so Congress wrestled with that notion and finally came up with Part D Medicare, which now provides coverage for uh, seniors uh, and generally provides free coverage for the impoverished seniors uh, to access that program without uh, any cost, even in the donut hole. But we still have a donut hole. We have seniors in that donut hole who are ending up having to pay 100% of the price of medicines while they're caught in the donut hole. you got the uninsured paying 100%, 100% of price of medicines. They have no insurance. You have insured pe- people paying too high a copay for medicines, even when they have insurance. Those are three big problems. Hopefully, the Medicare reform we're, de- we're debating in Congress today will begin to solve some of those. We have attempted to help. We've agreed to put up 50% discounts to all the seniors living in the donut hole. That's about, we estimate, about a $38 billion expenditure over 10 years to, to continue past the 10 years, as long as there's a donut hole. Uh, that, that's a big contribution. We think it's going to help a lot of seniors afford medicines through that donut hole to get to catastrophic coverage where the government then provides 90% protection. For those that are uninsured today, hopefully we'll get a bill that gives them a chance to get affordable insurance. For those that have insurance but don't cover them well enough, we hope the bill will, cover, will, will include a cap on out-of-pocket expenses. Because once you cap out-of-pocket expenses in, in health care, then you're assured that the co-pays on medicines will not drown a person who otherwise can't access medicines. 
Now, all of that said, that means that we're going to try to make access to medicines more uh, real to people and medicines more affordable through insurance coverage. That doesn't answer your basic question, which is how, to, how do you deal with the cost of patented medicines? And unfortunately, we're faced with two dilemmas there. On the one hand, it takes about 15 years to develop a new drug. And most people don't know this, but this pen, if it has a patent, has more protection than a new cancer drug. This pen has 20 years of patent protection, and you can start selling it day one when you get a patent. With a drug, you get your patent, and you don't start selling it. You start spending money. You start spending money on clinical trials that may last 12 years, may eat up about a billion or a billion and a half dollars worth of your dollars. It's a tough model. And the model produces a high cost at the end of it for the drug that finally makes it, particularly when you consider that seven out of ten drugs that get approved by the FDA don't recover their cost. They just aren't big enough. They don't have a big enough market to recover the huge cost of development and, and, the, uh, and the discovery process. It's a tough model. It probably can't work forever. We're probably going to have to need it, think about new models. There are some on the horizon. I'm, I'm speaking for a long time, and I apologize, but it's a, it's a it's great okay. question. It needs some of this explanation. There's some new models on the horizon. Herceptin is a great example of the new model. Herceptin was tested in two years, and it was approved by the FDA in that short period of time because it was a targeted remedy, targeted at women with breast cancer who also expressed a HER2 biomarker, a genetic marker that identified that specific cancer as one that a drug could target to cure. And Herceptin has been an amazing success. Instead of taking 10 to 12 years, it took two years, and it was tested on 547 women instead of 10,000. And as a result, 120,000 women have had the benefit of Herceptin and have had their breast cancer dealt with that way. We get enormous survival rates now with breast cancer because of drugs like Herceptin. It's, it's going to be the new model. So what can I tell you about it? I can only tell you that I can't do anything about the enormous cost of drug development. That's going to remain very high. If we do get a 12-year follow-on biologics bill, 12-year data protection system for biologics, it will create at least a place where in 12 years that cost can be recaptured on a new biologic and perhaps make them more accessible and affordable to people. And this is a patent extension. That's right? a, it's not a patent extension. Patents are still 20 years. You still use up most of it in the, in the clinical trials. It's a data protection system. It means that even though your patent expires, your competitor doesn't get, doesn't get the benefit of all your clinical trial data to go file against you. It protects you long enough in the marketplace so you've got a chance of, of winning mm -hmm. with a new product in the marketplace and succeeding in terms of the economics of doing so. Now, that, that's, not a, that's not a total answer, Jeff. It's even broader than that. The problem is that we have so many countries in the world who have adopted price controls on products that America is one of the few places in the world that encourages that research. It's why it's happening here, because we still have a marketplace for those drugs to be developed in. We can go one or two ways. We can adopt their rules, which puts price controls on these products, and we will see what happened in America what already happened in Europe. We'll see the demise of research and development. They pretty well lost their lead. They had 70% of the world's lead in, in research and development. They've lost it. It's now happening in America because of their price controls, because of their reluctance to introduce new drugs into their formularies. Or we can work on new models. We can work on new systems that uh, somehow get us to the finish line sooner so that you have a better patent protection period and we can work on new models where we can do the clinical trials much more effectively and efficiently as with, as with, with uh, drugs that are targeted toward biomarkers and toward genetic uh, conditions. And we can then move dramatically toward personalized medicine, which is where we all want to go. So a long, long answer. I apologize. But it's a complex maze, not one easily resolved. I can only tell you in the meantime we're doing our best to make sure, one, when people have to have a medicine, we can get it to them and free if necessary. Two, that we get better coverage for people who are insured and who can't afford the copays. Three, that we get more people insured. That's a key. That's, we saw that in Part D. We saw how it worked. And four, that we help those inside Part D 
get through that hole in the donut. If we do all those things with a cap on out-of-pocket expenses as a what we call in Louisiana the lanyap, if we can get that in the bill, we're well on our way to making more medicines available and affordable to people while we're going through this awfully tough process of, 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 of this discovery, clinical trial, high cost, long delayed, too long a process, a model that has, has got to be reformed at some point. Again, my apologies for going on for so long. So it's always interesting. Um, for folks who are struggling with, with uh, pharmaceutical costs, um, for a lot of those people, their most uh, enduring impression of the drug companies are seemingly ubiquitous direct-to-consumer ads. I watch yep. football in the Sunday afternoons with my six- and eight-year-old daughters, and I know one day I'm going to have to explain to them why those adults are sitting in bathtubs on a beach and the Cialis commercials, and I don't look forward to that day. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get that, but Neither do okay. I. I don't know how the bathtubs got there and how they're going to get them off and why that counts I as the romantic. Corona ads. I exactly. think they might have been um, <clears throat> But... Uh, it does raise the question, those ads don't come cheap. Um, and if, if, if that number were taken out of the pharmaceutical balance sheet, presumably those savings could be passed on to, on to consumers. Would the industry abide by either some kind of curbs on advertising or even a voluntary stand down for a period of time? Well, we have agreed to a voluntary stand down. Mm -hmm. uh, the, every company has policies now under our new pharma codes, which we've not only adopted uh, four years ago when I came to pharma, but we've now up, up, updated. <clears throat> Every company is required to post a policy on on, a, on stand down for a while uh, to get the drug approved and to uh, let it get in the marketplace for a while before they start advertising. And they do that in consultation with the FDA, and they do that. And they, we also agreed that the FDA would give prior uh, approval on the content to make sure that it's accurate, that the risk benefit profile is properly expressed because we have to do that under law. You wonder why <laughs> you wonder why in these ads they go through all the side effects? You know, I, I listen to some of those sometimes. And, Whoa, man, why would you want to buy that truck with all those things <laughs> happening? Uh, they have to do that by law. They have to give you the risk side of the benefit side, and every drug carries risk. Uh, I, you know, I, you probably know we talked about it, Jeff, but I, I had a 1% chance of surviving five years ago with cancer. And I recall when I went to MD Anderson to begin all the <laughs> infusions. They read all those side effects to me, and I said, I think I'd rather die. <laughs> and he said, not going to all happen to you, but we got to tell you everything. we got to explain it to you as though everything's going to happen to you. So what we've done is we've, we've agreed to, to some new codal provisions, self-regulatory provisions on the ads on television. Uh, are we through? No. We continue to revise them. We continue to try to make them better. Uh, but I can tell you, if you took them all off of tel television, it wouldn't dramatically affect the price of drugs. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a small component of the total cost uh, right. of, of drugs. As I said, it's about $4 billion of advertisement total, right. as opposed to this huge $250 billion we spent on drugs. In fact, if you took the profits of all – this is an interesting statistic. If you took the profits away from every drug company in America today, if they made no money at all, they had no money to invest in – new research. They had no money to distribute to their stockholders, the pensions, and all the people that invest in them in America. If they had zero profits this year, it would only, if, uh, it would only reduce health care costs in America by 1.5%. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it, the, the numbers are not there. It, it is not the deep pocket people think it is when you think about uh, uh, you know, cost of health care and the effect upon uh, whether or not we can afford health care in America. It is still a small percentage. 10% of the total health care dollar spend, and probably among the best spend we make. I mean, if people were really adherent to the medicines that are approved for them by the doctors, we'd be a healthier society today. The fact that half of those prescriptions aren't getting filled is, is not just a cause of concern to those patients. It's a real concern to the overall health care cost in America. It's where we're spending 75% out of every dollar on chronic disease not properly treated. Think about that. Can you um, tell me something, unpack a little bit the $80 billion deal Pharma has struck? Um, well, before I do that, I want to make one little story for you. Five years old, diagnosed with osteomyelitis uh, out in the, the bayous of Louisiana. Now, you can, you, you can lose your feet in Louisiana to alligators and a lot of things, but you shouldn't lose it to osteomyelitis. But I was a week away from having my right foot amputated. 
doctors had ordered it. We were preparing for the surgery. My mother read about penicillin. Hmm. Uh, Pfizer had just introduced it to the general public. It, they had used it in the military, but they produced a commercial version of it. Took it to my doctor who had never heard of it, <coughs> explained it to him, and he administered planet penicillin uh, to me in those big plastic needles in my rear end. Which I still have an aversion to shots now. <laughs> Uh, for about six months and cured my osmolitis. I still have my right foot today. So when you talk about direct-to-consumer information, I got a personal story to tell. And and the truth is, a lot of those ads, as much as they get us, they get us all excited and we object to some of them. A lot of them get people to go to the hospital, go to a doctor, and get tested because it tells them about symptoms, and they find out they either have that disease or many often something else, and they get treated. And that ain't all bad. Let's talk about the deal. Um, so, yeah, uh, people hear that $80 billion number, um, and I'm not so sure. First of all, it's a very big number, and yet a lot of other folks say, you know, it should be more. So maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. Can you explain a little bit about, about what the concessions are that you've made and how flexible that deal is for down the road? Could there be more? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, let me clarify something. This is not a, uh, an agreement that we went out to the – Congress or the White House and said, do we want to make a deal with you? We, that didn't happen. We got invited in to the discussions at the Bacchus committee level uh, about what our contribution should be to help health care pass. As you know, Jeff, we've been in support of health care reform for years. We've been advertising for it. We've been panels with many organizations supporting health care reform. Uh, we supported the expansion of S-CHIP. We came out with the Families USA for the expansion of Medicaid to cover more people. That's where we've been. We were invited into a discussion about what, a, what was our appropriate contribution in terms of pay for us to ha make it happen. We were told early off that they were going to try to get half of the dollars from the industries, healthcare industries, and the other half from some other form of taxation. Uh, at first, the President talked about a $640 billion bill, remember? And we were being asked to put up about $35 billion, which was appropriate. That's about 10% of half of the $640 billion. We didn't complain. We said, okay, we're still going to support health care reform. But this money was in, in the form of It was in the form of rebates. Or in rebates. Rebates in, in Medicaid. Who health care providers. That's correct. It was rebates. In effect, it was, it was lowering the prices of right. products to the, to the Medicaid populations. From, it was going to raise the rebates from 15% to 23%. Hefty increase. About $34 billion worth of increase. We said, yeah, okay, we're not going to complain about that because that's appropriate. That's about our 10% of the marketplace. Uh, the bill went up to a billion dollars pretty quick. Uh, they invited us in to talk about what would be an appropriate amount. We said, well, 34 times 2, you know, 65, 68 would be appropriate. They said, no, 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 we want more than that. We said, well, you understand, the more you take from the industry uh, and pay for it in excess of what we were told you wanted from us, the more you're going to affect the dollars we have available for research. In fact, one of our companies explained to Senator Bacchus at our first meeting that at the numbers they were talking about, we would probably have to lose 30 percent of our research dollars in, in that company. Uh, I just told you we spent about $50 billion a year total from all the industries in pharma last year in research. $80 billion is nearly two years of that. It's serious money. But they eventually said, look, we got to have $80 billion. Either, you know, either agree to uh, do that or we, or we can't go any further. We're just going to do what we have to do, and you have to do what you have to do. And we said, okay, fine. Okay, but can we talk to you about how we do it? They said, of course. That's what the discussions were all about. At one point, uh, when we were looking at how we do it, we were obviously looking for scorable dollars. I mean, Senator Bacchus needs to pay for his bill. So he's looking for scorable dollars that CBO will verify. At one point, we said, okay, we can either do that for you or we can talk about the hole in the donut. And which is more important to you? Both the, the, the Bacchus Committee and everyone else we talked to, including folks in the White House, said, boy, if you can help us with seniors' cost in the hole in the donut, that would be more important, even if it doesn't score. Because it's going to cost you, but it won't go to the government. It will go to seniors. We said, that's great. We've been working for years with Senator Bacchus trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, we give free medicines to seniors in the hole in the donut, but it did not count. If we can find a way to help them, that would be great. So 
we ended up with an agreement that said we would provide up to 50 percent discounts for seniors, for all the all seniors, rich or poor, for medicines they use in the home of donut. And that was the centerpiece together with Medicaid rebates, Medicaid rebates of, of, of the agreement we made. So we came to a number. We were the first to, to come forward and say we would support it and, and stand behind this agreement. And it not only did something very important in terms of drawing others in to talk about what they might do, and it did that. It brought a lot of other others to the table, hospitals and home health agencies, and a lot of different people came in and, and similarly agreed to make contributions. But it also did something very important in terms of helping seniors that I, I just described to you that we thought was very important. So we think it's a very, very uh, good agreement. We're very pleased so far that it's holding. Uh, Senator Bacchus is honoring it very closely, um, not exactly, but closely, and that's what we count on. And that uh, in the end that uh, we, we, we stand behind the effort to get health care reform done, and we hope our agreement will be part of it. Eighty billion is a lot of money. I know people think it's, uh, you know, well, you could have paid more. Yeah, we could pay more. We could stop doing research in America, too. This is a big chunk at a time when the industry is hurting, mm -hmm. when their sales are down and, and they're laying off people and they're having to go and try to, try to acquire new pipelines because their pipelines are weak when their patents are running out very rapidly in some companies. Um, it's not a good time for them. And they're putting up $80 billion to help get this thing done for America. I think they should be applauded, not uh, not criticized for it. In going in a, a different direction for a second, um, one of the most striking numbers in healthcare, global healthcare, uh, is that about 90 cents of every healthcare dollar goes to treat about 10 percent of the world's ills, which are mostly the ills in the Western developed world. About 10 percent of the healthcare dollar goes to treat 90 percent of the world's ills. Now, the number isn't as alarming as it would seem because the fact is a huge portion of those 90 percent of the world's ills are diseases that are relatively easy, easily treatable or preventable. Things like tuberculosis, which is obviously getting more challenging, but is still treatable and preventable. Yes. Things like malaria. Right. Um, the question isn't so much the available money as much as it is surgically targeting the drugs in particular. It's different if we're talking about something like mosquito nets to prevent malaria, but the drugs you need to treat these diseases have to get into the developed world have to be administered, and as we were talking about earlier, direct observed uh, treatment for um, uh, for tuberculosis, you have to also assure some kind of, of compliance on the terms yes. of the patient. Okay. What role can pharma play, or in the industry in general, in making these drugs available, in cutting costs further if that need be, and also in opening up pipelines so the delivery is improved and expedited? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you should know that we're not new to this game. Uh, we, we've been doing this for a long time. We're organizing better around that notion. Uh, we have, for years, our companies have been in many parts of the world where there isn't a lot of access to important drugs like that, where there's very little research being done on neglected diseases, for example, and where uh, there's no infrastructure to deliver or to administer those products to, to patients who need them. Uh, we've been very supportive of PEDFAR, and, in fact, we brought the – Departments of Health from most of the sub-Saharan countries uh, into Washington. We helped bring them here to make the case for PETFAR re reauthorization. We're one or more of our companies are in I mean, every one of those co countries doing work right now with their products. Uh, what we're trying to do is organize it now. We created something called the Global Access Initiative. We're working with the Bill Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, other NGOs to see what we could do to organize that in a fashion where access becomes better where research becomes available. Uh, we're even creating something called a virtual research uh, uh, concept consortium where companies who have the capacities to do research on early stage development for in, in rare diseases and neglected diseases can combine their efforts uh, virtually and begin the early work that, that we then turn over to governments in, in those uh, parts of the world where clearly that research is, import is important. You know, we're... we're uh, we're close to eradicating river blindness, uh, black fevers. We're close to doing a lot of that good stuff because we're beginning to organize a lot better with medicines that are available. We're faced with a b big new threat, by the way, and that's counterfeit medicines that have invaded most of those countries. Uh, uh, if you saw the Smithsonian uh, this month, they, they reported that over 200,000 
malaria deaths are attributed to counterfeit malaria drugs that are coming in from China and other parts of the Far East and, uh, and infiltrating those systems. Luckily, we don't have that in America. We have a closed system, and those counterfeits can't get here if, if the Senate doesn't pass a bad bill. Uh, but right now, those counterfeits are invading a lot of our work and causing a lot of problems. But we are organized. We're doing more. Uh, we can never do enough. But we, we have programs in place in most of those countries, company by company, that are assisting in various diseases depending upon where that company is associating its research and development and its products. Do we ever do enough? No, obviously we can't. Uh, but we're trying to emulate what we do here in America with our PPA program, is to, is to make sure that where we can, we make those medicines available either free or as cheaply as we can. We'll license them out for production at no cost. Mm -hmm. We provide others free. We provide uh, contracts uh, with, with governments to help provide them. And we're in those countries actually working on delivery systems and training of personnel. Something bad happened in a lot of those countries, I think you're aware of this, and that, and that is a lot of the trained personnel, the nurses and the doctors, got attracted out of those countries because they could make a lot better living in the Western world. And one of the biggest problems we find, even when we make product freely available, is that there's no delivery system or no physicians or, or nurses to, to do it. So we're working on that as, with the governments that uh, we work with around the world. Uh, pharma, is a, it, pharma is a U.S.-based trade association, but the members of pharma are global. The Japanese pharmaceutical companies are members of pharma because they do their research here because Japan doesn't encourage them. Most of the Europeans do their research in America, so the European countries are part of pharma. So we do have that global impact and a global reach, Jeff, and we're trying our best to do our best to be a part of the solution rather than the problem out there. And in the criminally limited time we have, unfortunately, um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, I'm hoping there may be some thoughts. If not, I have. My son Tom is here. You're not allowed to ask any questions, Tom. <laughs> and you're not allowed to say he lies. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to share family secrets, I'm sure. Um, well, then. Uh, yeah, here. Oh, okay, great. Billy. So, yeah. so um, earlier we talked about public-private partnerships, new mechanisms, pre-competitive models. We have that at the foundation yeah. for the NIH. Uh, they talked about the semi-tech model. Um, what do you think about that? Is that something that we need to pursue to work more collaboratively together on? Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, the companies are companies. You know, they're going to make business judgments about where where they develop and what they develop and where the real, you know, targets of opportunity look for them in terms of drug development. They also are Americans, and they're you know they're family people, and they worry about people getting sick too. And guess what? They're also part of our community here in America. 3.2 million people are associated with the industry who suffer the same diseases that you know I suffered, and a lot of people suffer. So they're concerned about that, and they're looking for ways to do that in public-private partnerships. They're looking for ways to help with rare diseases here in this country. We've got 6,000 of them that affect 25 million Americans that don't get looked at even. We've got three or four companies that do nothing but rare disease work, not nearly enough. Yes, any, any ideas about how our companies can be more proactive in terms of public-private partnerships? We already do a, a lot of that with NIH and a lot of that with academia across America. The more we can do, the better. We, we're trying to bring in the foundations into more uh, close proximity to us so we can work with them uh, in different ways. Uh, we've created a rare disease subcommittee of pharma and a small company. Uh, a, a subcommittee of pharma so that we have we get those those perspectives in our discussions when we make policy at pharma but anything you want to bring to the table we'd love to look at can I just have one quick question yes, on, totally unrelated have you done a cost benefit analysis on direct to consumer in terms of how much hurt it's done in terms of the bad will and anger in um, Congress on it because it is a huge huge issue yeah yeah I, I, let me agree with you uh, you know I've had these discussions with the board CEOs so I'm not speaking out of uh, church here uh, I think you're right I think it's done a lot of damage and that's why we're working so hard to self-police it if we can number one it's done a lot of good and we know there's a, there's a benefit to it. We know it's done damage. We're trying to find that balance. Where, where's the right balance of, of that it does help people get good information so you don't lose their feet? <laughs> Imagine a politician without a right foot. I couldn't stick it in my mouth when I needed to. Um, it, but at the same time, to, to make them more 
patient friendly, more informational, more helpful, more educational. We're trying to find that balance. And, uh, you know, I'm dealing with marketing departments in the companies who principal purpose is to market a product. At the same time, we're also dealing with uh, the, the company and their moral obligations to do what's right. And we're trying to balance that out. At the same time, remember that what we do is supposed to be good for patients. That's a tough call. We're trying to, we're trying to find that sweet spot. And with that, I think we're going to relinquish the floor to the next panel. <laughs>